today to talk about Tears of the Kingdom, but first can I just say, how good is Zelda? <laughs> amazing game. They have a history of revolutionising gaming with Zelda games, all the way back to the very first game, the Ocarina of Time, 25 years ago. Can you believe it? Um, yeah. Six years ago, Breath of the Wild was revolutionary, and Nintendo have done it again this year with Tears of the Kingdom. So, I would like to ask the audience and the panel please join in. Who has beaten the game? Oh. And who has 100% of the game? I'm always <laughs> So impressive. So we are here from Zelda Universe. We are one of the largest and longest running Legend of Zelda fan sites and online communities. And you can find us through our website, zeldauniverse.net, and we're on a bunch of different platforms as either Zelda Universe or Zelda Universe TV. So if you're itching for more Tears of the Kingdom discussion after this panel, jump onto our website or our forums, and you can chat to us and you can chat to loads of other Zelda fans all around the world. Yay. My name is Shona Johnson, I'm one of the webmasters, and I am joined by a panel of Zelda Universe staff um, who are all longtime Zelda fans. So panellists, can you please introduce yourselves and tell me quickly one thing that stood out to you while you played Tears of the Kingdom. Hi, my name is David, I'm the Editor-in-Chief, and really the thing that stood out for me is uh, I I'm in the games industry too, and all of my game industry friends were just amazed at the physics, like the fact that, you know, bridges work, this is not a thing that exists, and the fact that they're not just canned animations, they really polished this game and it really stood out to me. Yeah, uh, my name's Cody. Um, for me, yeah, I agree. The polish is just incredible. Like the what you usually expect with these kinds of open world games is you're trading off huge, you know, op all sorts of options for loads of bugs. Um, you know, and that's that's the you know the Skyrim experience. Uh, but Tears of the Kingdom is just incredibly impressive to just be able to let you do anything without uh, any issues. Wow. Good afternoon all, my name's Callum, huge, huge Zelda fan since my very early days and Tears of the Kingdom has brought something very, very special and unique which I think all of us have enjoyed. It's totally unique for me, it really stands out and it's in the Zelda universe, it's unique in that it's a direct follow-on from the previous game where you're in the same world, history has progressed, everyone knows your name, it really feels like you're back in that world of Breath of the Wild which is truly amazing. It's unprecedented in the fact that it's followed on from what is widely renowned as one of the greatest games of all time in Breath of the Wild and built upon it in such a way that everyone's debating whether Breath of the Wild is even relevant. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we'll so, get to that a little later. <laughs> and I think just to finish in the video game world, it's unparalleled in what it's brought to the open world gameplay with the building and the world having a sky and the depths and all there is to explore has just brought so much more to the table that everyone was thinking it might just be like a DLC expansion of the previous game. I think that's been proven to be quite incorrect. So yeah, very, very special game. Yeah, so <laughs> before we go any further into Tears of the Kingdom, we don't want any tears from the audience, so I want to give a fair warning that this panel will contain some spoilers. Now that said, when we first came up with this panel, we thought that nothing would be off limits because the game's been out for five months and like that's plenty of time for everyone to have completed it, right? <laughs> well, for those of you who didn't have your hands up earlier, we know that there are people who haven't had time to finish it. We know that there are people who are deliberately taking their time and savouring the game and don't want to do the very ending until they've collected every last piece of horror. <laughs> so, <laughs> we know this game has a few really big moments in the main story that we feel are best experienced when you play them for yourselves. So when it comes to some of these moments, we're going to talk about them on a bit more of a general level. So we'll intentionally be a little bit vague, if you know, you know, but we're not just going to come out and outright say what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so as we have 
stated, Tears of the Kingdom is a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild. It's set in the exact same world, and this is really rare to reuse a game world. It's the first time that it's happened in The Legend of Zelda, unless you count A Link Between Worlds. Um, and all of us on the panel here approach Tears of the Kingdom with the perspective of having played Breath of the Wild first. So, I would like to ask you, did Nintendo do enough to make revisiting the same world interesting? I mean, I think so. Like, I, I, I knew everything there, but the thing that really stood out for me is that I had a really close attachment to a lot of the characters from Breath of the Wild, and so much of it is like, I want to see what's gone on with their lives. Like, this is not something you get to see, like, you know, dot, 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 three years later. What are they doing now? And I think it was really cool to see how characters have evolved. Like, Riju is one of my BFFs, and I'm like, ah, she has gotten so much in the past three years, and that's really cool to see, that her growth arc, too. Yeah, no, I, I think it's... Breath of the Wild is a game, I guess, about a post-apocalypse, mm -hmm. and whereas Tears of the Kingdom is a game about rebuilding after the apocalypse, mm -hmm. and I think they were able to make use of those themes to make it different enough that um, you know, it's really quite interesting to see how the actual characters and everyone have sort of moved on um, and continued. So I think that was definitely worth it. I wouldn't necessarily want a third, you know, a third game set in the exact same world. I think you can pull it off once, but you know, like I think it was a really good thing they did. Uh, my answer is a definite yes, yes, yes. Um, finishing Breath of the Wild, I don't know if anyone else here experienced that, but again, and after 120 hours, <laughs> and instantly had to go back to that world of Hyrule after the ending, and I really had this need to want to see what the world was like after Ganon was defeated, and that wasn't there. And the ending was like, it's Zelda and Linko, and let's go and rebuild Hyrule. And there was a real need for me to go back into that world and rebuild it and protect the people that needed protecting and Breath of the Wild has now become Tears of the Kingdom which brings all of that and more so <clears throat> I could not have been happy with what they've done to bring us back into that world and I really think Nintendo knew that too they were like we need to progress this more this game isn't finished yet and yeah Bravo. yeah and I think they knew that they would also need to change enough to make it interesting, and I think they definitely did that. So, do you think you need to have played Breath of the Wild in order to enjoy Tears of the Kingdom? I see some <laughs> heads being shaken in the audience. Um, well, I think it's one of those things where, I mean, you definitely gained things from having known the characters in Breath of the Wild, but I, you know, I think going to Tears of the Kingdom first is an experience that I think a lot of people are going to be having. Not, not us, but a lot of younger people especially um, are going to be playing this first, because, you know, Breath of the Wild's old. It's for old people from six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's so old. So, you know, but I, you know, I think it stands out on its own. It really, in some ways, it sort of um, just ignores a bunch of the stuff. Well, not ignores, but like, you don't really hear about the Guardians and all that from Breath of the Wild again in Tears of the Kingdom. It's got its own story that it's telling that is standalone um, from the story of Breath of the Wild. The history, I think, does give a little bit of extra context to it, because I oh, yeah. think, like, th there's the impacts of, like, yeah, you've got the monster control crew that's like, we're going out, we're going to face the monsters, and that was not a thing that happened before. So I think it's one of those, okay, cool, if, if you didn't play it, that would not mean, it would not be as poignant as it was without Breath of the Wild, but do you need to know that to go in there? No. And especially, I think, could it be possible for someone who hasn't played Breath of the Wild to go back afterwards? Well, the abilities are different, and it, like, the entire world is recontextualized because how do I traverse from point A to point B? Well, you, you do it very differently. Like. I, I, I missed Rivali's Gale, but then when you realize you can replace him with a rocket, it's totally like a, a different experience. <laughs> yeah, so I'm wondering, anyone in the audience, did you play Tears of the Kingdom before Breath of the Wild? None. <laughs> oh, the one way back yeah. there. Oh, wow. Two, two, two people. Wow. Okay, yeah. So exploration, it's at the heart of many Zelda games and once again it's key in Tears of the Kingdom where you find secrets, secrets hidden in every nook and cranny. So how did you find re-exploring the same world that you visited before?
Did you use any of the new mechanics to travel around? And did you enjoy revisiting familiar locations and seeing how they changed? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say that I really enjoyed um, the bits that were slightly different. Um, you know, to be honest, there's so much in Breath of the Wild, so much space, that there's a lot of it that just by taking a different route, it will feel like it's new. Um, especially if some of the stuff you visited in the early game, you've got deeper memories of it, whereas some of the stuff you visited in the late game with and breezed through it, and you have less memories of it. If you go to that new area first, it, you know, that feels new, aside from all the new things that there are. So I think it's, yeah, the exploration, I didn't have any problem with it. It was, it was a big topic of discussion before the game came out, like, is this just, you know, glorified DLC? <laughs> Uh, basically, but I think um, I think that was that was proof wrong. The exploration for me is one of my favourite things to do in a video game, and explore a world um, that has been so artfully created is one of my favourite things as well. And no one does it like Nintendo and Zelda. Um, and Tears of the Kingdom has taken it taken it to a whole new level for me. And one of my favourite things to do with some of the older Zelda games, and I recommend this um, if you feel so inclined, is most, mostly with Twilight Princess and with Wind Waker, is to rush through the game, unlock all the world, finish all the dungeons, but don't collect anything. Save that save file and duplicate it, come back to it nine months later, and I've just got the whole world to explore. I really enjoyed doing that with Twilight Princess, especially in Tears of the Kingdom has just taken that to a whole new level for me, where you're just walking around in this cave to explore, and next thing you know, you're in the depths. Uh, it's three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you go, I'll just go back to Lookout Landing and save and let them know that I found some scriptures or whatever. I might go down the well and there's a cave system that takes three hours to get through that takes you into the heart of Hyrule Castle and you walk out going, okay, this game's amazing. And, and, and now it's 7am, you still have to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I really loved going back to familiar locations. Um, one example is Tarrytown. Like, that place is thriving now and I just loved seeing how much it had changed in that time when you basically founded that town, you helped to build it and to see all these new people living there and the extra areas that they've expanded out to. Yeah, and one of the things that really kind of amazed me when I see, look online is, I, I certainly didn't play this way because I found it right away, but <laughs> they don't just hand you the paraglider. They, mm. There are people who have gone for hours on the surface with that, like, I don't know if they just have lots of fairies and smack in the ground and survive. I don't know what they're doing, but I don't know how you not do that. I'm like, okay, fine. I just happened to go that way. I'm like, okay, cool. Thanks for giving me the thing, but not every you took a long time to a little bit of time to find it. It was just because I was exploring. Yeah. Like, I knew eventually I was going to go talk to that person. But I still just like, you want me to fall down without the paraglider? Are you mad? <laughs> Water doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. Look, I will say, I'm pretty sure people have completed the game without the paraglider. They have. Uh, and so, you can do all sorts of things. I, there's, you know, some incredible contraptions. I mean, we'll get back to that later, but I saw someone in the first week of release get to the depths without the paraglider by just, like, sticking three gliders together kissing, basically, and they, and so, and so they all fell down at a steady pace into the depths. Oh, that's so, awesome. yeah, yeah, you know, that's, incredible. Um, talk about the new areas going into the depths. We have the sky, the depths, the caves and the wells. Nintendo heavily promoted the sky during their marketing of Tears of the Kingdom, but the depths were a complete surprise. So what did you think about these new areas? The, the sky was definitely not what I expected. I was expecting there to be, you know, without even thinking about this, there's going to be thousands of islands up there not realizing that you wouldn't be able to see the sun. That might be, <laughs> that was my first thought. It's like, okay, it's a little bit not much. Um, and then you kind of go up there and like, oh, there's a few of the same islands over there. But then you go into the depths and it's like, I avoided that, like the plague for the first few hours. I'm like, no, I see that guy who's like sick over that. Nah, 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 nah. So I almost like didn't even go down there to do what I then realized, oh, that's actually part of the story. Okay, I guess if, you, if I have to. But like, you get down there, it's scary at first. It's really yeah. big. But then it's like, oh, is it just a little bit too big? Do they not, like, there's a few like Giga outposts down there, but eh. Okay. I think I'm just scared running for my life for the first, like, third of the game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, the, the incredible part was the bait and switch that Nintendo pulled on us, because they kept advertising the sky, and so everyone was like, oh, is this a, you know, is this going to be that Skyward Sword, or we, you know? Um, and then the sky was a minor part of the game, and they actually had a completely new section that they didn't mention at all pre-release, and 
I really enjoyed that aspect of it, um, you know, because we, I, I like to avoid some spoilers, but, you know, we run a, a Zelda website and have to report the news, so, you know, to some extent, there's stuff that we're just going to learn. Um, but, you know, I was, yeah, I didn't expect the depths at all, um, and I really loved the depths. I'm a, um, I really enjoy what I call podcast games, which is just when you can, you know, put on a podcast or something, not think, really, just wander around, you know, exploring, not, you know, and that, that was an aspect of, like, when I'm like, oh, I'm just, you know, I don't want to be doing quests and talking to people and stuff, I just want to be wandering around, I was going into the depths, and that was really enjoyable. Yeah, I, I loved, loved the depths, and I think all of us enjoyed that experience, and it was such an amazing surprise, and kudos to Nintendo and the way they can keep such a surprise. I think they were very, very careful that they knew gamers would love to discover that, and that's what Zelda's all about. I spent way too many hours down there going through 200 arrows with bright blooms, and I just <laughs> loved exploring the darkness. I had a job to do, children to look after, other things to look after in life, and you know, 200, 200, 200 arrows, that's my jam. Let's go. Um, but I really, really respect the portal that the sky brings to the game. So the islands, and a lot of verticality and I really enjoyed exploring how do I get to that island now that I'm on this bottom island. I enjoyed that. It wasn't a huge part of the overall gameplay, which I respect highly because it didn't overtake. It would have overshadowed too much of the game if there was too much to do in the sky. Um, but it really created a portal where you could get into the tar tower, shoot up, and actually I've never played Fortnite, I'm proud to say that. <laughs> but I don't know if Zelda found a game that's done it, but to fall from you know, miles up in the, arc, in the sky and you can see the whole world, and choose where you go, this level of discovery, I just could not get over that. I would love that and I would always end up going down a chasm and lighting up the darkness with my own eyes. Yeah, the sky was more of a late game thing for me because the sky is more fun when you have um, lots of energy to burn with your devices and things because you can just, you can travel wherever you want across the sky. So I, I liked that mix of like, you're on the surface for a while, you go into the depths so that you can explore the sky better, you know, and you're sort of going in a bit of each one. Yeah. All right, it's time for our first <laughs> trivia question. So we've got a few of these questions for our, our panel, and here's how it's going to work. Question will appear up on the screen. If you think you know the answer, raise your hand. Do not call it out. We've got a roving mic um, who'll come to one of you. Um, if you get the question right, then you'll get a prize. So here's the first question. Which flower, when included in recipes, <laughs> restores hearts damaged by gloom? I believe those are sundalones. That is correct. <laughs> differences between Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wilds. So, so gone are the Sheikah runes and the Champion's abilities and instead he has new hand abilities, he's got Sage's abilities and access to a whole bunch of Zonai devices. So some of these abilities do have similar concepts to Breath of the Wild but Tears of the Kingdom really takes it further with more techniques and applications. Like as Dave said before, did you miss Revali's Gale? Well, he's been replaced by a rocket or a spring or the That's ascend ability, etc. So Ultra Hand is probably the ability that we all use the most and the ways that it can be used are almost limitless, especially when you add in all of those Zonai devices. So I'm going to play a little video clip which shows just one of the many, many examples <laughs> of how it can oh, be no. used. Which one? <laughs>
bit of a learning curve. I'm sure <laughs> we've all been here. <laughs> Things do you like to build? Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed building. Um, like some of my best memories of the game were just improvised. Um, like there's a type of shrine where you sort of there's an orb you have to sort of you know carry it to the location and it activates the shrine. I thought, all right, well the the orb's up high, the location's down low. I can put it on with the glider. Um, and you know, get there. I fell into the ocean halfway through, and then I had to quickly figure out how can I turn this aircraft into a sea craft. Um, and of course, you know, if you're in the water, you can't use any abilities. You have to be standing on on it at the time, so you can't pull it out of the water. And so, you know, just that whole hectic, just keep attaching things to it, hoping it will work. Um, experience was some of the, the most fun that I had. Um, but yeah, you know, in the late game, I was like, um, there's a couple of sort of really quick and simple, um, you know, hovercraft, or I use the, the the goblin glider, which is the you know the the fans are to the side, and you're just in your your little uh, uh, controller. But um, you know, there were a few easy ones that I used a lot, but there were yeah, some. Yeah, and that's where the auto build was really handy. Yeah, and but yeah, there were some that were just chaos. <laughs> uh, one of the cool things, I there was one shine, I only really got stuck on one shrine. I spent like 45 minutes in there, like, what is? What are you even asking me to do? And eventually I realized there was this like, like, little ramp, that the block that you could slide up the wall. And eventually, I, after a long time, I'm like, I think I can actually like drive it along the wall, just have horizontal wheels to drive it. And it worked, and I'm like, okay, great. Now it just took me a while to get like all the things in place. But it was one of those, like, I realized there's a lot of crazy things you can do with this, and I I never really I think untapped the full creative potential of this until I started like very late game of like I should just not use the gliders and actually like use some of these things I've been hoarding for so long. Yeah, I'll, I must be really really um, genuine here and say that most of my building turned out what a two year old probably. Be able to put <laughs> I really thought I'd be a little bit better prepared for this with all my years of Lego as a child. I thought I'm going to do it. No, this is going to be great. And that failure you saw there, just repeat that. And it was in. I had so many building failures. I started to embrace it and really enjoyed it. I think my favourite aspect of building, strangely enough, was the huts and building signs and yeah. finding unique ways to stop them from falling over. And I was, as a two year old, would do just put trees together and <laughs> up on top and try and get it to balance and yep, yeah, come on, don't fall over and it didn't and I felt really proud when they didn't fall over with my yeah. abysmal creation and somehow <laughs> somehow put gravity to at, at bay for a few minutes. Yeah, it's funny, I think um sometimes I was just really keen to like get on with things and so I don't know if I'm just lazy or it's my engineer brain. I was like how can I build this like as simple as possible with as few things as possible because I just don't want to waste time here and then other times I'd just be like, you know what, I don't actually feel like making progress. I'm just going to build something crazy and ride it through the fields and basically run down monsters a bit like what we saw in that video. Yeah, the, and combining it with some of the abilities as well, like the, the secretly most overpowered ability in the whole game is the rewind time, because you can combine that with your ultra hand or whatever and say, all right, there's a platform on the ground, I'll use ultra hand, lift it up, it drops, I stand on it, I use reverse time, it lifts up, I've made a I've made a platform and it's like you shouldn't be allowed to just combine these. <laughs> so have you seen anything obviously lots of people are sharing their builds online on social media. Have you seen anything that's particularly amazed you? <laughs> I mean like yes. <laughs> there are so many ones where they're like let's go take on a Gliok with like 70 lasers. <laughs> and I'm just like, I, I still have not gone after a Gliok, they terrify me, I'm not doing that yet, but I'm just like, now I'm just like, oh yeah, maybe I could do something like that, that might be easier. <laughs> yeah, no, the, um, there was one that was basically, they had drones fighting for them, but like, you know, because you've got the auto lock on, uh, you know, Zonai devices and stuff, and they just had like, Eight of them flying out from their from their vehicle, and it's like this is yeah, this is just modern military warfare. <laughs>
Yeah, one that really impressed me, it's quite common, I think most people have seen this one, it was early on where someone created a multi-stage rocket, it was very, very clever engineering where the first missiles went off and the rest fell off and it kept going and Link ended up at the top of the, <laughs> top of the sky, it's like very impressive engineering. It, it, oh, it just amazes that. me that there is actually a subreddit called Hyrule Engineering. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's a thing. Check that out if you haven't. And the most incredible part is that we're only a few months in. Breath of the Wild, I'm still seeing tricks in Breath of the Wild where someone's like, oh, I'm going to shoot an arrow and across the map and it's going to hit a guardian in the eye. Um, or it's not, and I'm like, how, how, how do you do that? And that's a that's six-year-old game and they, I just see new tricks. Yeah. This is an even more incredible you know, series of things that you can do. So I imagine in 20 years they'll have recreated you know, I don't know, the USS Enterprise or something. <laughs> <laughs> And they'll just be flying around on a spaceship. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but as I've looked at all of these amazing creations that people have made, I've wondered what Nintendo have been thinking. And just a couple of weeks ago, the game's director actually gave us his thoughts and said, players are making vehicles and creations that are far beyond what we had expected. <laughs> and we are really amazed at the imagination of our players. Now, I'm not surprised that people have taken everything further than what Nintendo first thought. But I, then I do have to wonder what they think about all of those devices people have been making specifically to torture Korok. <laughs> 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 Send really stood out for me, and the fact I totally forgot to keep using it for the first 60 hours. I'm stuck and scratching my head. I thought, of course, I can just go through the roof. For Nintendo to give you the tools to basically go and break the game. It's a bit of a developer flex, would you think, Dave? Like, it's like, you can't break this game, can't yeah. it, it is amazing. And, like, I, I, I know I used the Send pretty early in the game because it was one of the it's one of the ways I inadvertently sequence broke things. But it's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I, it, but it is one of those of half time, like, I was being an idiot and just like I'm climbing up these cliffs not realizing I could have I could have just done this so much easier about two thirds of the way up and I'm like, why didn't I think about it? See again, I'm, I'm so lazy and I'd always try to find like, oh there's a little bit overhanging or I'm gonna see if I could just descend up and save some time. <laughs> And going back and playing other games now that aren't Zelda, but you walk under a bridge and you just automatically... <laughs> <laughs> they can only do that in Tears of I mean, once I started finding, like, the flux constructs with that, like, the first the first few times, like, they were up there, I'm like, what? Like, I can't attack you up there. And then I have to realize, oh, 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 okay, fine, yeah, okay, I, I, I get this now. I just walk away and come back, and I'm like, oh, you're in a different format, it's fine. But no, it was actually really cool to see offensive capabilities of, like, everything. Where like, you go, I, I would only fight stone taluses with a sand. Like, I would only go under them, go up, smash the thing on the spot. I don't care if they hit me while I was trying to line up the green <laughs> circle so I could ascend. That's the only way I would kill them. Yeah, the fuse for me is um, incredible because the amount of things you can fuse to others, like, the amount of things you can fuse to your shield and add to an extra ability to your shield, like, Spring shield is yeah. awesome. Yeah. In, in any other game, the mirror shield is an upgrade that you get. In this game, you just it attach a mirror to your shield. <laughs> so, you know, and there you go. Now you've, you know, you've got a mirror shield, now you've got a spring shield, or a flamethrower shield, or a laser shield. Um, you know, there's just an incredible range of uh, combinations there. Yeah, the Bokoblins really the... don't like the spring shield. They keep getting pushed back and they're trying to get to it. They get a little bit angry. Yeah. And what about the Sage's abilities? Let's talk about those a little bit. Which ones did you find the most or the least useful? Chulin was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. The best one. Best boy. Um, for me, the least. Yeah. I hate to say it, but Sido. Oh, yeah. I, I was like, by the time I, he was my last, and I'm like, by the time I'm like, I've already got enough hearts, thanks. 
I don't need you just like, and like, it's, it's so contextual, like, oh, I can clear muck out, but I just cleared all the muck out, so thanks. Yeah, I mean, the, some of them are, are useful for combat, and some of them are useful for just grunt work. The, the Goron one, it breaks rocks, and that saves you a whole lot of time finding a, finding a sword, sticking a rock to it, hitting it a bunch of times, finding the next broken sword, when instead you could have just been using, um, you know, Goron attack, uh, which by the way, the uh, Gerudo one also works for, for breaking rocks, but um, yeah, I, so I did the Gerudo um, dungeon first, and so that gave me a big appreciation for the for that lightning one, because I was just using it everywhere on everything. Because um, when you get more and more of these companions, it becomes less and less easy to actually pick the one that you want. <laughs> oh, I, and I feel like trying to pick up an item off the ground and I'd set off Ritu and everything uh, would take yellow. Like, no. there, yeah, there's some, there's some funny videos of like accidentally activating Tulin and then the yeah. items you're about to pick up just oh, fly yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh. what recall is here. That's what I'm oh, that's what I should be doing. Really recall. My, uh, my peace eyeball's about to fall off the cliff and I need it to fight a Gleok, so no, come on. Oh, yeah, no, the recall I use a lot for just, you know, I'm trying to set up, you know, I'm trying to attach a, a sled to a rocket so I can go up, but I'm sort of on a slope on the mountain. It runs off the mountain into the lake. I'm like, no. Come back here, um, you know, and stand still while I can while I can use you to uh, you know to fly up. So definitely a lot of use of recall. Yeah, the abilities were a really fun mix, and it got to the point where if you did want to use them, you had four to choose from, and it really added a level of chaos or control in chaos uh, with some of the big battles, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, outside of like, you know, but where the heck are, oh, you're over there, fuck, get over <laughs> here right now. And when you really need them, they, they can't get there. You know? and, yeah, I think it's it's also a big, well, so it's a nerf from the Breath of the Wild abilities, because I think those were just supremely overpowered. It's like, come back from the dead, you know, fly a million miles into the air, you know, whereas these were a bit more, um, localized i guess but you know they still found ways to to make use of them yeah all right it's time for our next trivia question what is the actual name of gloom hands was it shadow oh, oh it's it. that is correct Yay. So how did you react the first time you came across Gloomhands? Lots of swear. <laughs> I, I, I honestly did not think they could make something more terrifying than Guardians. <laughs> the first time I saw it, I kind of just saw it in the corner of my like, screen and then it went away and I'm like, what was that? And then, I think I was in a low bay late labyrinth and after I completed the shrine, I saw it over there and I'm like, Oh, hi, way over there, and then all of a sudden disappeared, like, okay, that's fine, and then it had come around to me, and I'm like, warp, 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 get out of there. Yeah, no, I was already, I encountered one, I was already on the run from a terrifying frog in the depths, <laughs> and, and I was like, ah, a safe, a safe big skeleton to, to rest on, uh, and then, yeah, and then came the hands, and I was like, no. <laughs> Yeah, I think they've officially overtaken the Gibdos and Majora's Mask because it's terrifying. He's all experience there is. Yeah, well, if they also screamed and made me freeze, um, that could combine to make the most terrifying Zelda <laughs> enemy of all time. So I can but, pretend nobody had to use it. I mean, they had the same effect where they'd grab onto you and, like, squeeze the life out of you and you had to, like, button mash to escape from them. Well, the fact they could also, like, take your, take your sages away from you, too. That was just like the, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> So yeah, any time I saw them, I'd just be like, nope, out of there for so long. And then I actually found one fairly early on, and I was up on the ledge, it's one of the ones near a shrine, and I realised it couldn't get me, so I'm like, right, I'm going to shoot you with some bomb arrows, and sure enough, the, the health starts going down, and I, I'm like, I'm going to kill it, and I felt so proud of myself. And then Finn began and appeared, and I was like, I'm not ready for that. They actually make Phantom Ganon feel a little bit easier. <laughs> Battle of Dread with the Gloom Heads. So, on to the topic of combat. Many of us have strong opinions about the weapon durability mechanic. 
Now, some hate it, some think it's a fun challenge, and I think in Tears of the Kingdom, Nintendo tried to make both sides happy with the weapon fusion mechanic. So the weapon may still break, but if you fuse items to it, it adds strength. And you can also add you know, fun and silly effects to the weapons too. So what did you think of this, and did your perception of weapon durability change between Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom? I mean, I was always kind of a fan of the weapon durability, only because like in Breath of the Wild, the first third of the game was like you are a scavenger you are getting by from battle to battle and it's like just trying to make sure you have enough <laughs> crappy weapons to get through the game and like this one actually made it really good because i realized i can just take my sword my good sword and attach just something on the end of it like another sword and then that one will break I'm like oh i just have another one attach again and i like i've got my good sword forever suck it so it was actually really good for me i thought it was actually really good yeah, the, um, the combat for me, I thought um, there was a longer period of time in Tears of the Kingdom where you're still underpowered as compared to Breath of the Wild. Like, especially playing through Breath of the Wild a second time, I'm like, all right, well, I'll start the game, I'll find the hardy Durians, I'll give myself like 17 extra hearts, um, and then I wander around, you know, with technically three hearts, but, you know, just a full set of hearts. Whereas this, they sort of, well, they cut down on that, I can't find the Hardy Durians anymore. Um, but, you know, they also, just the combat continued to be difficult for me for quite a long time. Um, and I think part of that is because, yeah, they just balance. I think they, they took the lessons from Breath of the Wild and continued to balance it better. Well, I think they really forced you to really lean into the fusion mechanic, because they pretty much said, like, all the weapons are bad now. You can't find anything good. So if you want to find something good, you actually have to use the things you have, and plus 40 of your things actually make something that's not single digits, which is a pretty amazing uh, early on. Yeah, it's almost like there was no such thing as a bad or a good weapon. Now. Mm -hmm. It was up to you, and that made it fun. I actually pers purposely didn't <laughs> trade in any Koroks until I had 130, so I only had a few weapon slots for most of my experience in the game because I was having so much fun trying to survive and build weapons with what I had and that scavenging experience that you mentioned from Breath of the Wild to be able to sort of force that on myself it was really enjoyable. Yeah, oh, sorry. I, th sorry. I think the um, part of the combat, like the part of the combat that people really enjoyed in Breath of the Wild was when you went to Eventide Island, um, when, you when you had to be a scavenger again, because the problem in Breath of the Wild was you stopped being a scavenger fairly quickly and started you know, just being overpowered. Um, and so bringing that back to the basics was you know, a really fun experience for a lot of people. And I think they took that idea and said, how can we make more of the game like that? Mm. Yeah, the Tears of the Kingdom allows you to tackle the enemy encounters in a variety of ways. So you can be sneaky, you can be direct, you can build, you know, hydraulic presses that smash the monsters like we saw before. So what was your preferred style of fighting? I think I just went in with, with weapons. I'm like, all right, fine. I, I, it's weird because I thought like in Breath of the Wild, I got really, really good at doing like the perfect dodges and all that stuff. And I sucked at it in this game. I couldn't get them, but I'm like, it's all right, I've got enough parts to tank things, and I can just go in, and it's more fun to just be like direct and smash things with whatever I got. And Callum, what about you? I really enjoyed what the purpose that combat now has, because you can fuse the monster parts to your weapon to actually have a reason for combat, whereas Breath of the Wild became a bit redundant after a while. But I like taking out the biggest, baddest boss, Bok Oblin, fuse him to the weapon and give me more power to take out the rest of his guys. I really enjoyed that that challenge, like who's going to give me the best monster part to make my stick a formidable weapon, basically. It's like I'm not just stealing your weapons this time, I'm, right. I'm killing you with the remains of your boss. <laughs> but I, I also remember, like, it was, like, in Breath of the Wild, those flame and electric weapons, I, I guarded them for like those certain things, and I could just like, oh yeah, I can make anything an electric weapon right away, and so it actually became a lot more fun, and I was a lot less precious about some of the things I was using to attack things, because at some point you just start using a lot of arrows too, like, oh yeah, have, I, have, I have a zillion fire fruit, bang, fire. And if you guys found any of the Gerudo weapons, which when you fuse it, it actually makes the powerful 
It amplifies the power incredibly, so I've got a few weapons which are 120 power and you can just one shot everything. It's like, that's too good, I don't want to use it, I'll save that for later, but yeah, I'm, done yeah. It. I'm using it. <laughs> yeah, and I loved the, the muddle bud. So when you yeah. just shoot oh, yes. into a group of enemies and watching them fight each other, or oh, I find like a group of constructs near a group of enemies, like a Coblin yes. camp, and I'd, I'd like shoot an arrow down and they both come out to investigate and then they'd start fighting each other. So I just, like, just, just, just sit back and watch them take each other oh, out. Yeah. Yeah. Gloom spawn turn into a Looney Tunes card and they start hitting each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to present a quote from the game's art director about the dungeons. This time the dungeons are huge and each carry their own regional look and feel, just like traditional Legends of Zelda games. Now, this was something that he said before the game was released and many people took that to mean that Tears of the Kingdom would have traditional Zelda dungeons. And while we could sit here and have a whole separate panel on what exactly constitutes a um, traditional Zelda dungeon, um, typically for those who haven't played Zelda games that came before Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, we'd have um, a special item that it was focused around, we'd have a mini boss halfway through, a boss at the end, and you would find maps, compasses, keys to help yourself navigate. Do you think the dungeons in Tears of the Kingdom are traditional? No, I, I think I think what the quote there is getting at is that the dungeons are now themed again. You know, yeah. I think a lot of what people were missing from the dungeons was like having a fire dungeon, an ice dungeon, you know, a desert temple, um, that kind of thing, and that's what they did add back in to this game. But I don't think, you know, I mean, to some extent, you know, there, there was, if some things had been changed, if for example in the dungeons your companion only came in halfway through and, and that unlocked a bunch of things that, you know, your, that new ability could get you. That would be more of a traditional dungeon structure, but that's not what they were going for. They, they were dedicated to the openness of, really, you can do this stuff in any order, which is sort of in contrast to the, the methodology, method, methodology of doing a traditional dungeon. Yeah. And traditional dungeons for me, I feel, really comes down to the enemy encounters, not the boss or the mid boss, but there's a real challenge of getting through the enemies to find the keys and work your way back and use the key. It didn't really have that experience for me, um, which I highly respect because it goes with the whole open and free approach, but that's for me what really separates it from a traditional dungeon. Yes, it had one or two keys in the dungeons, but you could find any way to get them. It wasn't a huge puzzle and you didn't have to battle your way through a huge amount of you know, enemy challenges to get there. Yeah, I found that for me, they still felt a lot like the Divine Beasts. We had to go instead of the five terminals, it was like, well, the five things that unlock the main thing. But yes, they had their own theme. Um, I really enjoyed some of the lead ups to the dungeons, though. Um, I felt like that was really part of that whole experience. Um, for me, especially like the Lightning Temple, when I first went in there, and it was like, well, first the whole bit of fighting the armies of the Gibbos with the Gerudo, that was cool. And then I felt like I was, you know, exploring like ancient Egypt, going into the pyramid, and had almost like a Tomb Raider vibe, and then finally get into the heart of the dungeons. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, these are more reminding me a little bit of the Divine Beasts. And what about the boss fights? Who was your favourite boss? <laughs> uh, definitely the Rito boss. Yeah, um, yeah called Gara, um, where you can kill them by skydiving into them. Um, that's just such a fun mechanic. Whenever I would sort of see them again in the depths, um, I would always be like, great, I can, you know, kill some people with skydiving again. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I had my, my squirrel suit, my paraglider outfit, so I can manoeuvre and, and all of that kind of thing, and I really enjoyed that one. I can't remember the name, but I just loved the Slut Shark. It was so out of place, oh, 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 so oh, unexpected, oh, and so oh, like, did the Splatoon developers come in and just help you out? And it just had such a quirky, goofy character to it. I loved it. It was great. What is it with what yeah. dungeon? <laughs> Colgera was, I think, the most fun for me, but my most memorable was Sea's Construct, because I, I, I have reasons for that, and we'll get them to them later, I think. Okay, let's have another trivia question. Since getting married in Breath of the Wild, Hudson and Rodson have had a baby. What is their child's name? That's Madison. That is correct. <laughs> Madison story too. Yes. It's so emotional. <laughs> All right.
Have you taken a photo of her back to her father yet? I've got the photo, I haven't actually taken it back. Yeah, yeah, do that. Oh, yeah, on, on the list. <laughs> Breath of the Wild was all about Link's solo journey of discovery. <coughs> so he's exploring the land, he's trying to figure out what's happened, he's meeting all these new characters a hundred years in the future. But in Tears of the Kingdom, teamwork and companionship are the main themes. So while Link has had companions in previous Zelda games, to the people he meets in the game, he's usually an outsider or a strange kid. But in Tears of the Kingdom, everyone knows who he is. They're eager to fight beside him, and you've got a proper team behind you the whole way. So this is a, another break of tradition for the Zelda franchise. What did you think? Loved it. Like, the fact that I had a team going in with things, and the fact that you could fight alongside NPCs, we're like, we're going to go clear out this monster cave. It was so good. It was just, it was, it was really, like, wholesome for me. Yeah, I, I think it goes well with the theme. I was saying earlier, Breath of the Wild was a game about apocalypse, and the point was that you were alone. Like, I don't think this sort of system would have worked in Breath of the Wild because it would have taken away from the experience of, you know, it's you in a post-apocalyptic world. But in this one, it was about rebuilding. It was, you know, there were teams of um, people out there fighting monsters, and so having your own team and all of that, you know, made sense to me. It worked. I love the team, and I love the way they all had their own character in battle. Like, I need you, Goron, I need you, and he'd be in there, barging in, you had to really work your way to get to him, and they really, really ingested a lot of character there, which hasn't been there before. Um, but I really felt like Hyrule, everyone in Hyrule was my friend this time. I was known, they knew my name, um, I was a hero, they like Link, you rock, there were kids that worship Link and running around trying to be like Link. And, uh, it really felt like uh, a really good progression from Breath of the Wild where, you know, you're presence and your actions from the previous game have really moved over and everyone just did let Doug Link. That was awesome. Yeah, and one of the cool things about Tears of the Kingdom was that we got to revisit a lot of our friends from Breath of the Wild and see how they've grown and how they've changed and that's something that has really happened in Zelda games. But in Tears of the Kingdom, plenty of other characters get to share the spotlight. You know, it's not just Link, Zelda and Ganondorf. So who were some of your favourite characters? Yes. I, I, I liked Riju. I mean, I mentioned her. She, her growth arc is just so yeah. big in this game. Pura was also really cool to see, especially kind of the, the interaction with Robbie and Pura fighting over the naming of the Pura pad. Um, I, it was just really cool to have those little, like, extra things in there that really kind of made the characters more than just one-dimensional beings, NPCs. Yeah, no, I really liked um, the reporter, the, the himbo bird. <laughs> you know, I, th I thought he was he was great. Um, I really liked that whole little sub journalist sub quest. So that, that was good. Yeah, clearing Zelda's name for all this yeah. <laughs> poor press that was happening around. I love it. Um, I really really love the the. Don't want to spoil too much, but yeah, most people have probably done this. The you know, putting the band back together, like that was a real, <laughs> yes. and the impact and how everyone in the town loved it when they were playing music. I just yeah, really loved that, and that was one of my favourite um, characters with the band leader. Yeah, yeah and even Master Koga and the Yiga Clan had <laughs> a stronger, a separate role, but it was a bigger um, role. Did you enjoy the Yiga side quests and battling him again? Yeah, look, they. They're the best stand-up comedians in the game. <laughs> uh, they've always got something funny to say. They've always got something extra funny to say if you've collected the full Yiga set and they think that you're one of them. Um, and that's that's just really a great a great time. Like, you know, you'll come across a fake Zelda or something sitting there and you wander up to them and they're like, Hey, can't you see I'm undercover? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love the whole infiltrating the, the Yiga clan side quest. And also, I became a blade master. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they did a really good job with the Yiga clan. I think one of the first things I did was go back to the Great Plateau and check out the old man's shack. And it was all boarded up and had all the spikes yeah, and the fences. Like, What's going on? And then there was a big Yiga clan battle and they got their hideout and they're all taking notes on links. On a link if you read their diaries and their plans to, to avenge what happened in the previous game. I thought they did an amazing job with the Yiga clan and really injecting him into that world. Yeah. He's so goofy. Yeah, so in Tears of the Kingdom, Link is solving the problems happening in the present with clues left behind in the past. How did you feel about having a lot of the story being told through memories? Yeah, I mean, I think the memories, the memories were fine. I think you can have, I don't know, people have different experiences depending on which memories they found first. 
there is a, there is a level of sometimes you just run right into the bigger spoiler um, at the start, um, and you know maybe that's good. I don't know. It's it's part of it's part of their philosophy for the game. Everything should be open. They could have they could have made it so that you know no matter which memory you go to, it plays them in a certain a certain order first or something like that. But they didn't because they're dedicated to you know this has to be open and that means open. Um, and I don't know. Yeah. Compared to traditional storytelling, I'm not sure. I think it, I think it was a good story, um, but yeah, I think it's just you know it's really about the their mindset in creating the game what, as to why they did that. Yeah, I was really surprised that it was that they reuse that memory mechanic. I really thought it was going to be a real time story. Mm. And I really respect, as you said, they could have had it so no matter what teardrop you got, they would have played it in the order. And I really respect that they allowed the player. The enjoyment of piecing the story together. I think that's really important part of the experience. It's almost like the Zelda experience is trying to figure out where it fits in the timeline or what the lore and history of the world is. And to inject that experience into the storyline as well, I really enjoyed. And I actually didn't remember how to get the teardrops for a long time. I've forgotten how I got the first one. And then I, you know, so I've missed most of the story until a fair way into it, and then starting to piece it together really got a good experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, Enforcers, do we have another two hours to talk about where it fits in the timeline? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Zelda's story. So she finds herself in a pretty desperate situation, caught between the present and the past. What did you think about her journey? I think she had a really good story arc. I will. I, I want to say like it was a really interesting, you know, place of like just trying to understand like what was going on, and then kind of understanding like, oh wait, this connects to what happens, and I know what the future is, and I have to kind of like figure out what I'm, why, a, a, why am I here, and I don't know if you know it actually was intentional or not, but how do I actually best fulfill both of these problems at the same time? And it was actually a really great story arc to it. I would have liked to not hear the same story over and over and over again whenever I beat a dungeon, but the story arc itself is really good. Yeah, I think Zelda, I like this approach but because I think Nintendo got a lot of critique about Zelda's just a damsel in distress, she's just there waiting, and they came across a new way to do it in Skyward Sword where Zelda's having a better adventure than you. Um, <laughs> You're not allowed to see it, but she's out there having lots of fun, and um, and I think that's a better method than the damsel in distress one. You know, I would have look, I would have liked to see you know playable Zelda or all that kind of thing, but that's you know not what they're going with, unfortunately. But I think this was a, a good way of doing it too. Yeah, the character arc, her story arc, I think um, progressed from Breath of the Wild perfectly. Uh, where in Breath of the Wild she was very much trying to live up to her father's expectations and who she was and what she meant to Hyrule and she just knew that in Tears of the Kingdom. She knew what she had to do and she did it if it meant she had to make a sacrifice and you know whatever she had to do she did. I really really respected her character growth. Yeah and it was quite emotional too. <laughs> so what did you think about Ganondorf as the villain? Can I first just say, I am so glad they voiced him. It was, Matt Mercer was amazing for it. It's really, really, really good. But it, he he felt like he had, sin, he had some sinister ambition. And one of those of, I think, just hearing his voice and just that, that gravelly sort of like tone really just like, uh, you mean business. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad that they put that in there so it's like, right, I, not to be trifled with. He was, and he's key. Like when he came out in that, and he spoke with that voice, there was a real regalness to it. The voice acting was absolutely brilliant. And like this, Ganon is a king. He's not just someone trying to become king. He is king. Like I re really think that nailed it. That aspect of his character. Yeah, I, I just think that whenever, whenever the Zelda series has an actual villain instead of a generic blob of evil, I think it's just like a yeah. usually a big improvement in terms of ending and you know anything else. It's like you know you've you've got. You got some, you know, a character there, and I think Ganondorf is a, yeah, he's a fun character. Yeah, I completely agree. He was a much better villain than like Calamity Ganondorf. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the ending, but again, without completely spoiling what happens. So we'll talk a little bit about the lead up to the final boss fight, the final boss fight itself, and then the game's ending. So 
Although Tears of the Kingdom is pretty much as open as Breath of the Wild, you don't get the destroyed Ganon quest at the very beginning of the game. And when you do get it, it's not quite as straightforward to go straight to Ganondorf. So what did you think about the path to Ganondorf? <coughs> it, it was good. It was, it was intense. I don't want to spoil too much, but like, it felt rewarding to go do that. It felt like it was a challenge and I was seriously threatened the whole way. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it, yeah, again, I think it's a big improvement over Breath of the Wild's ending. I think this is another one of the areas where they just um, took the criticism about Breath of the Wild and then uh, improved on it. There's three parts of this to, um, to me that really stand out. I really respect that for this game, it wasn't Destroy Ganon, which I loved in Breath of the Wild. That was so good. Um, but this one, the whole Driving Force, was fine. Zelda, I really love that, you know, the mm -hmm. investigating, trying to track down Zelda, what, what's, happened, what's happened, where she's gone, what's going on there. Um, I actually got to the end of the game and like, oh, I'm almost done now. Just fought Phantom Ganon in Hyrule Castle. It's almost over. I was nowhere near the end. A long <laughs> way to go. So I really like how they sort of turned some of those expectations upside down, but that run to the final Ganon battle, ultimate gameplay experience, I think they absolutely know that. Yes. Whoever hasn't done it yet, please do it whenever it you feel so comfortable. It so much fun. Yeah. And then the final boss fight itself. What did you think and how does it compare to other final Zelda boss fights? So there was a moment, and those of you who have done this, you know, where you laugh out loud, but oh, at the same point right. you were terrified. <laughs> it, it, that, that was like, Okay, buckle in. <laughs> um, but no, it, the final the final fight was it, it was a masterstroke, and it's it was it ties in the whole thing. It's good. The most intimidated I have ever been in any Ganon fight. I actually walked away. I had no chance of beating him. The way they presented him, the regalness of his voice, the way he jumped down like a lordly samurai, and he's just brushing you off, and then absolutely bothered me in the battle. I didn't have any upgrades on my armor and stuff. I had to leave and spend 40 hours upgrading to come back. <laughs> <laughs> every other game I played, like, I was like, What's really cool is that yeah, the difficulty can also be what you make it. So mm. you can go in there really early with, you know, basic weapons and not much armor or you can really like wait and level everything up and go in with like 50 heart recovery potions and have a different experience. Yeah, Lionel, Lionel <laughs> bone with Gibdo bones which add 40 power and 3 times 40, it, it does help a lot. <laughs> I kind yeah. of cheated against Ganon, I feel bad about that. And then with the game's sure actual ending, were you satisfied with the overall resolution of events? 100%. Yes. yes. Yeah, so was I. I felt like Breath of the Wild, again, it sort of left things open and you're like, oh, I want to know what happens next. And this game really, I think, just wrapped things up and you, I, mean, I just felt so good and so happy. And... and they took the characters and the player on a journey that's yeah. not really been taken to those depths. I think they really, uh, really did an amazing job there. But that finality to it with an open openness to the future, I think was really, really nice touch at the end and just what the game deserved. Yeah. Okay, so another trivia question. What is the name of the wagon used by the stable trotters? Oh. 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 Yeah. Yeah, is that do we have any anyone? Okay. Is it a <laughs> so we had a few Oh there's one over there. One over there. As soon as they yes. say it, we're all gonna go. Oh. <laughs> No, it does start with a B. One in the back right there. Is it Breezer? Yes! <laughs> 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 All right, so we've explored Tears of the Kingdom's journey through the past and the present, but what about the future? <laughs> Zelda producer ATR Numa has said that this time there are no plans to release additional content because he feels like he's done everything he can to create games in that world. Were you disappointed to learn that there won't be any DLC or do you think this is a fair point? <laughs> Cody? Um, well, I mean, I mostly just took this as a sign that the Switch 2 is closed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think there's definitely, look, there's definitely more to see. There's one particular character whose story arc from, is never resolved, who doesn't reappear for Breath of the Wild, um, who I would have liked to see. Um, but, you know, 
So maybe we'll get a definitive edition on the Switch 2 or something, we'll have some extra stuff, but I think this, on its own, this was, yeah, this was the Breath of the Wild DLC, this was, let's add everything that we can think of to this base game, and so I don't mind if there's, there's not more. Okay, and our member has also said that, like Ocarina of Time did, where it created a format for many Zelda games that followed it, um, Breath of the Wild has created a new kind of format for the series to proceed from. Would you like to see future games following in the same format used by Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom? Um, I don't think that can kind of not. Like, absolutely such an amazing experience in the world and the physics. And the developers are absolute geniuses there. They can put a totally different feel and unique experience to it that wouldn't just feel like another Breath of the Wild, as they've done with every Zelda since uh, Ocarina of Time. But yeah, they've created such an amazing way to experience a Zelda game. I don't think they can go back with the main mainline, the hero titles. Yeah, I think, you know, for the mainline titles, I think we'll be seeing more of this in the immediate future. Hopefully we can see some top-down Zeldas again. Yes. I don't want to wait six years for another Zelda game. No! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll fall the bits. All right, we've got our final trivia question. What does Colton do with the bubble gems you give uh, him? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here in the middle right now. That's correct. Well done. <laughs> so sadly, we're almost at the end of this panel. Um, but I just want to ask you a couple of final quick questions concerning Breath of the Wild. After playing Tears of the Kingdom, do you think you could go back and play Breath of the Wild again? I did not play I, I kept thinking, I'll play Breath of the Wild again when I've forgotten everything, and I never did. And I I don't know if I could do it. I think this just changes so much, and I think I'd miss too much about Tears of the Kingdom to go back to Breath of the Wild. Yeah, I just, I just need time to, to... Because I need time away from Tears of the Kingdom, and then to go back to Breath of the Wild and see... You know, because I think there are ways in which Breath of the Wild is a more focused game than Tears of the Kingdom. Like, there are things about it, it's not just entirely being replaced by Tears of the Kingdom. Its abilities are separate, you know, there's no... You can't um, stop time on a log and then hit it a bunch and then fly through the air on the log, um, you know, or all of these other things that you could do in the original. There's still actions and stuff that are unique to that game, so I don't think it's been just overwritten by the new game. Yeah, I was personally, for the first time, my Zelda Breath of the Wild, I didn't replay. I was looking forward to saving that as a game that would be with me for the rest of my life. <laughs> I could go back to and go in any direction and discover things I hadn't discovered. And Tears of the Kingdom has totally ruined that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, one day I might play it again, but I really do think Tears of the Kingdom has replaced it. Okay, so I'm going to ask us all to pick a favourite. So, audience, oh, please oh, join in. I'm going to ask you to cheer for your favourite game. Okay. So, if you prefer Breath of the Wild, cheer as loudly as you can. <laughs> And if you prefer Tears of the Kingdom, cheer. I know, I knew. Thank you so much. That's all we have time for today. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, let alone the depth. But um, thank you so much for coming to our panel. Um, don't forget